On the Spot brings you Survival in the Bush. This is Bob Anderson of the National Film Board. It was decided to put me on the spot in this film you're about to see and get me out of this producer's office for a while. And so I found myself on location, as we call it, and it was a tough one, the wilderness. The problem we wanted to deal with in this film was what do you do when you're lost in the bush? Here's what we did. but it's been going on for a long time. When do we get there? Well, this looks forsaken enough. Ready to slow down, Arthur. Well, this is Robert Anderson speaking to you from somewhere in the Quebec bush. And the purpose of our being here is a little experiment on how you survive in the bush. When you're wet, when you're without food or transportation, and when you have no implements to assist you except one that we're being allowed, a nurse, the scalpel, a woodsman's axe, and a woodsman, because this is a test of woodsmanship, my friend Angus Baptiste. And he and I will be going through this experiment during the next period. Now, um, we have judges here with us, Mr. Ernie Reed and Mr. Arthur Smith, and they're going to see that things go along all right. Now, the business about being wet, I'm afraid we have to look forward to. This is water around us here. The idea being, of course, you've lost a canoe, upset, or you've gone down an airplane, something of that nature, so you have really nothing to help you along except an axe. All right, I guess that's about all there is to it except for the dunking. So after you, Alphonse? Uh, no, after you. <laughs> hey, just, hey, just a minute. Sir? One little formality we've forgotten. I better go through your pockets and see what you've got here. Anything, uh, what's this? A knife, eh? It's a very little knife. What else have we got here? I guess we better go through them all now. Oh, it's just back here. Very useful pet sack. Chicken, one whole chicken. Well, it's a very little chicken. Now, what else have you got? Well, the, absolutely the only other thing that I have is some matches which I maintain I would normally have in such a situation. Certainly you would. And we'll leave them with you. Wet, of course. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I'm sorry about this. It's not that I distrust the woodsmanship of my friend Baptiste. It's just the fact that... Uh, uh, it's so long since my Boy Scout days. Well, I guess that means that about all there is to do is go in. This is it. <clears throat> well, here goes. Oh! Oh, it's cold. <laughs> I don't like this. Oh, it's just <laughs> Lovely day for a swim. <laughs> Anyone for tennis? There's another member of our crew who's the cameraman. You won't see him very much because naturally he'll be behind the camera. But the next splash you hear will be that of Doug McKay, our cameraman. Well, I guess that's all we need you for. Thank you very much. That's about all we have to do, gentlemen, is get to shore. Okay. All for it. It's deep here. These trees are uh, half submerged. 
But uh, with any luck, we'll make it. Oh, well, that canoe would come back. We'll try. We'll try. Somebody make it. Okay. We'll try this thing. How are you doing? It's steep here. Which we should remember, I guess. If I can make this now. Oh, well. Oops, sir, heavy. Oh, mine too. How are you doing? Oh. All right. Oh, I can lift it. You okay? Well, now that we're ashore, let's take stock. We have a few problems. One, we're very wet, cold. And pretty soon we're going to be hungry. And as we are going to be hungry, we're not going to stay long in this campsite because this swampland doesn't support much in the way of wildlife of any sort. Our first problem, however, is to get warm and to get dry. And Angus Baptiste is going to make out of this dead jack pine both firewood and something to start the fire with. Ishkude Kodjigan is the implement that he's going to devise here. That means, Ishkude Kodjigan means in our Algonquin, fire stick. We have no matches, and this is going to be our way of starting the fire. Now, this isn't the only way of starting a fire without matches, as any Boy Scout in the audience will testify, but it's a very good and efficient way of doing it, and here's how you go about it. He fashions a groove in this piece of dry jack pine with his axe leaving splinters at one end, and then, taking the fire stick that he's fashioned separately, he rubs it in the groove, and the friction caused by the uh, fire stick in the groove uh, produces the uh, the flame which ignites the splinters. Well, there's smoke, and I hope that fire follows automatically as it goes in the old saying. good to me. At least now we'll be able to get warm and get dry. The agreement with our judges is that if we're able to accumulate enough food and find a method of getting out, we will get out. Otherwise, they'll come back and pick us up three weeks hence. Now, the main thing to do is to get warm and to get dry. And this fire looks like a good opportunity. So, if you'll excuse us, we'll just get rid of these wet clothes and we'll see you tomorrow from a new campsite, I hope. Good morning. Dinnerware. Northern style. Well, we've got a new home. Come on in and have a look. We moved here because of many obvious advantages of a site like this. We're out in the open here. We can be seen from the air, from the water. We could signal if we wished to be located and heard something going over by this signal fire that we've got laid here. And we're relatively comfortable, although we're still a little hungry at this point. Other advantages of such a site are it's breezy enough here so it'll keep off all these various insects that throng this part of the country, like black flies and mosquitoes and sand flies and deer flies, that sort of thing. Well, let's have a look around now and see what's going on. Over here, Angus Baptiste is making our house. This is a lean-to made of saplings and covered with sheets of birch bark, which are overlapped to keep the rain flowing off then lashed down with other saplings tied together by strips of cedar bark. Lovely stuff, this birch. The uh, end of the lean-to is open to the fire so that you get all the heat that's going. And our bed is going to be made of balsam branches that we have here. You start at the pillow end and you simply stick the 
butts of them into the ground so they don't stick into you. And you keep overlaying the things, and it makes really a very comfortable bed. I see Doug McKay, our cameraman, coming down with another batch of bedding. Well, so much for shelter and bedding and warmth. Now the problem of food. We haven't had much of a chance yet to do anything about that, but we've made certain preparations, such as we have plates for the food that we hope to get. Uh, there are always berries, of course, in the woods to be found, and uh, roots, such as the roots of water lilies, which you can boil into a fairly useful broth. If you happen to have a depression in the rock around your campsite, you heat the water by heating a stone in uh, the fire and putting it in. It'll actually boil the water for you. Another thing, the knives that we have here. Uh, bones found along the shore of the lake, sharpened on a rock to a very good edge, uh, enabling you to cut meat or, something I learned today, to eat the sap from under the bark of the birch. A very edible business. <clears throat> now, other preparations that we've made for snares and for fishing lines, spruce roots split down and kept pliable in the water. Here's a fishing line, a couple of them that we've made. And the uh, hooks are made from forks of the branches of the spruce tree. They're weighted down with small rocks. Do you think we'll catch fish on these? Oh yes, they're okay. Good. On the way, we'll be looking not only for fish, but for game. Looking for the trails and the tracks to see what animals this region affords, because we want some meat. If you know what to look for, the signs animals leave in the woods tell you a lot. These are tracks of a large bull moose, fresh tracks, leading toward the little lake nearby where the moose probably feeds. We're downwind, and so if there were a moose on the lake, we'd see it. Of course, we couldn't do much about it with only an axe. But there may be smaller animals. For example, here's a rabbit run, a path worn by the rabbits through the brush. You can snare a rabbit if you're lucky, by putting your spruce root snare across his path. As he runs along his familiar path, Mr. Rabbit's going to get a surprise from this hangman's noose. canoe or other means of getting out into the deep waters of the lake to fish, you're lucky if you come across falls like this, because here you're pretty sure to find fish, and because they can't feed out in the rough waters in the center, they congregate around the shore, and with these implements that you make in the woods, you're apt to be able to find fish. I don't know how much you know about sturgeon. I was surprised to find there was such a slow and sluggish fish. Angus made a uh, fish snare out of cedar bark, a running loop on the end of a pole. 
And with it, he took out of those quiet little pools by that lovely falls several more sturgeon that same morning. Well, that meant that we had no more immediate worries about being hungry, and it also meant we could think in terms of storing up food for the trip out. How to get out, of course, was the problem, but Angus Baptiste had the answer for that one. He's an Algonquin Indian, and his father had taught him how to make the birch bark canoe. He said he could make one with the only tool we had, an axe, and that I had to see. I'm sure that if I were alone in the bush, I certainly wouldn't tackle a birch bark canoe. I'd stick to something more simple, like a log raft, tied together with spruce roots. But uh, here's the plan of operation for making a canoe, if you're interested. As you can see, it's a fairly complicated procedure. But what you do first is look for a big tree to get the bark from. And that's just what we did. Now, when he's got the uh, log down, he splits the bark along the length that he wants for the canoe. And then he's going to just peel it off the way you peel an orange. The things you can do with an axe. This business of stripping the bark takes a good deal of time. Um, and so what we're going to do now is leave the process here and bring you in on the later stage of the development of the canoe. Well, you know, I think I'm getting pretty good at these canoe slats. You learn. That wasn't you crashing around the bush out there, was it? Hey? No. I heard something. While I was just at the beach there, and I wasn't in the bush at all. Still, I don't suppose any animals come near the firelight. Not, not that, uh, not that kind of flame. When it's on, when that kind of flame is on, there's no animal except a bear. Except a bear. Yeah. Would he come? Uh, how close would he come? Oh well, he wouldn't come very close with uh, a flame like that the first night. What about the second night? The second night, he uh, he get used to us. Hmm. Maybe you. You can even see him passing on the other side of fire, for that matter. And I thought the fire is not, is not quite flame enough to keep him away from it. And the third night, he may do worse than that. He even come into the linto here and put a paw into you and reach over for this food that he's trying to get all the while and walk away with it. In the morning, you would get up no oh, lunch. Where's my lunch? Who bears walk away with you without you notice? And that's the tricks of all you. Well, let's keep that fire going tonight. This isn't serious fishing. This is fun. It's pleasant sitting here. We can afford to sit, too. We've been doing very well so far as food's concerned. Here's our dinner, sturgeon. We've been boiling it in this natural stone pot with hot rocks from the fire. And here are more sturgeon from the falls. We're smoking them so that we'll have a good supply of food when this canoe is finished and when we'll go off in it. Well, as you see, we begin to have a canoe. I'll tell you how this all came about. We brought back the birch bark from the woods, and Angus laid it out here flat on the ground, and then he made a shape, which eventually will be the gunwale of the canoe, and this shape he placed on top and weighted it, as you see, and then he bent the birch bark up around, and it's held in place by thickets here. Now, Angus, what about the other stages of the making of the canoe? Next stage would be to raise the gunwale outside and inside, and Strip this bark off here, even with the gun, the two gunners, the outside and inside, and a sword, this sewing with the 
spruce tree. You actually sew the gunnels together. Inside and inside. And a sword, a sewing with the spruce tree. You actually sew the gunnels together. Yes. And, and then, the, after that? Uh, the crossbar has got to be put in there. Um, after the crossbar has been put, you sew the end over there, with also with spruce root. Then, you sort of put the uh, slats in there. They lie in the hole of the canoe. Yes. And you put the ribs in there to strengthen the bottom of the canoe, or the whole canoe. Yes. Well, uh, as you see, there's a good deal yet left to be done. Uh, we'll bring you back at a later stage when we're gumming the canoe. This work goes on all day and also by the firelight at night. Hey, what's that? Is there a rabbit, eh? A rabbit? Oh, it's a baby rabbit. What do you want to do with him? Eat him? Eat him? With all those kids in the television audience? No, we've got plenty of fish. I think we'd better let him go. He's a... Do you think we should let him go? Oh. What? Lucky for him, we've got those fish to eat. much like the idea of tackling a bear. But I guess it's different if you know how to make the force of nature work for you. But I guess this is your deadfall, eh? That's right. Well, how's it work? Well, if you pick up that, them two sticks there and put the shorter one upwards and the longer one down towards the ground, and I'll lift it for you and see how it's done. Like this? Yes, sir. And in this notch here? Right in that notch. Well, how's that? Well, now what? I'll have to put this stick in there in order to get the bait inside the center of this cabin, which is uh, to put the bait in there. And the bear would be in this position with his two paws inside this cabin. The reach for this bait is inside of that cabin in order to, to set the, the trap off. You want to see how it's done? Certainly do. For you. Now, watch us close. Well, that's not heavy enough to hold him down, though. No, but I got to start add with these logs and put them on top in order to weigh it down. And so is the same, just the same on the other side, on the other end. You sort of set a loaded trigger. Then. That's right. Right. And that holds the bear in. That's all, that holds the bear down until he makes his re last resistance until it dies. Maybe a couple of hours from now. I see. Well, now, we've had a bit of a setback. We were just about ready to leave. Now, all the food that we'd gotten together is gone. So it's a matter of trying to get another stock of food together to keep us on our way out. So we'll report to you in a few days' time. Well, something's happened since we last spoke to you. You remember our deadfall? Well, come over here. A deadly, effective instrument. That bear weighs about 400 pounds, I would think. I don't altogether like to show you that. Come and see what else we found here. Angus has got a friend. He's not uh, altogether sure of things yet. We thought we'd better just hold on to him now and feed him a little bit until he feels a little more comfortable about things. He's a cute little thing. 
The cameraman's belt went for his collar. The rest is a matter of spruce roots and bark. Not very happy yet. We're sorry for this little fella. We thought we'd keep him around for a bit and feed him up. Our birch bark canoe is almost finished. Like to have a look? Angus is sealing the seams with spruce gum. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Would you mind stepping back, Angus, let them have a good look? Yes, sir. get away from there. Angus isn't going to like that. He's an awful nuisance, but he's rather sweet to have around. He got one of Angus's boots the other day and made quite a mess of it. I think I'd better take you and put you up on your pole, young fella. What do you think? You twist that spruce root off. Take it easy, McQuarr. Easy now. Take it easy. In all that confusion, McQuaw, our little bear, got away. I hope he's gotten rid of that collar by now. We'd intended to turn him loose anyway. Certainly, if we'd taken him along in our canoe, he would have clawed right through the birch bark in no time, and we'd all have gone to the bottom. Well, this little experiment of being left in the bush has shown me one thing. A little basic knowledge of woodsmanship may save your life. And the next time I go hunting or fishing, I'm going to remember to pack along with me some dry matches and that tin of chicken they wouldn't let me get away with this time, and certainly an ax, and if I can, I'll pack Angus Baptiste too. Too bad we don't have a bottle of champagne to christen that thing with. All right, Mr. Cameraman, it's time to go. On the Spot is a production of the National Film Board. Survival in the Bush was directed by Bernard Devlin, photographed by Douglas McKay, and narrated by Robert Anderson. The technical advisor was Stephen Greenlees, and the film was edited by David Myrovich. <laughs>